Today's video is sponsored by Magellan TV, a wonderful documentary streaming service for all of you big brains out there. Their mission is to tell the great stories that have defined the human experience. And with more than 3,000 excellent programs available on Magellan, it's hard to stop watching once you start. They've got everything from the Greeks to the Great War, plus modern history, biographies, scientific profiles, true crime, and so much more. And their team add more content every week. And what's one thing you love about paid streaming services? There are, of course, no ads. Now, if you're still working through through some of that leftover Halloween spirit, you might want to check out Magellan's popular Halloween playlist, or if you're more of a classic Today I Found Out fan looking for highly entertaining war content, you can head on over and check out their eight-part docuseries, Combat Machines. It's good stuff. I'd recommend it. This holiday season, you guys can take advantage of a special deal with Magellan by clicking on the link in the description below. You can snag a buy one, get one free deal for an annual membership. That way, you can give the gift to Magellan and keep a little something for yourself. Win-win! It's content for days and days, so let Magellan hook you and a friend up. You'll be glad you did. There's a link below. And now today's video. A large, unruly crowd of people could be a truly frightening thing and a dangerous one. Indeed, crowd stampedes have been responsible for some of the deadliest peacetime disasters in modern history. On December 30th, 1903, a fire broke out at the Iroquois Theatre in Chicago, resulting in the deaths of 602 patrons. Many of the victims died not of burns or smoke inhalation, but crush injuries and asphyxiation as they piled up against the exits, many of which had been locked during the performance to prevent patrons from sneaking into more expensive seats. More recently, on September 24th, 2015, a crowd stampede and crush resulted in the deaths of 2,431 Muslim worshippers during the traditional Hajj pilgrimage in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. But few crowd stampedes have proven more consequential to the course of modern history than that which took place on May 30th, 1896 on Kodinka Field in Moscow during the coronation of Tsar Nicholas II. Known as the Kodinka Tragedy, this incident was to prove to be one of the many sparks that would eventually ignite the Russian Revolution and bring about the downfall of Imperial Russia and the Romanov dynasty. And strangely, it all started with a shortage of sausage and beer. Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov, better known as Nicholas II, was born on the 6th of May, 1868, to Tsar Alexander III and Tsarina Maria Fyodorovna, who ruled Russia from March 1881 until Alexander's untimely death from kidney disease in 1894. Due to the long official mourning period, Nikolai and his wife, Alexandra, were not crowned Tsar and Tsarina of Russia until two years later, on May 26, 1896. Though Peter the Great had moved the administrative capital of Russia to St. Petersburg in 1712, Tsars continued to be crowned in Moscow, at the Domitian Cathedral in the Kremlin Fortress. To mark the occasion, a series of magnificent celebrations were planned for the city. Hundreds of distinguished guests from European aristocracy and foreign dignitaries descended upon Moscow, which was decked out with flags, triumphal arches, and columns, and thousands of electric lights. Concerts, military parades, and royal processions were held on the city's grand avenues, drawing crowds of tens of thousands. Celebrations for ordinary Russians were no less grand, with Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, the Governor General of Moscow, arranging a series of entertainments and gifts for the people of the city. These festivities, scheduled for four days later on May the 30th, would take place at Kodinka Field, a large open area on the outskirts of Moscow. The field, which once served as a training ground for the Imperial Army, had previously hosted the coronation celebrations of Alexander III and was judged sufficiently large to accommodate the anticipated crowds. Grand Duke Sergei spared no expense in making these celebrations as lavish as possible. Over 150 temporary theatres, show booths, and pubs were erected on Kodinka Field, and over 40,000 buckets of beer and mead prepared for the occasion. Revelers would also receive a special gift package from the Imperial Crown, consisting of a bread roll from famous Moscow baker, Filipov, a piece of sausage, some walnuts and sweets, a piece of gingerbread, and a commemorative enamel mug bearing the new Tsar's monogram, all wrapped in a headscarf printed with images of the Imperial couple and the Kremlin. But even these generous preparations were to prove woefully inadequate. Though the issue of the gift packages was not scheduled until 10 o'clock on the morning of the 30th, on the evening of the 29th, large crowds of Muscovites had already begun to gather on Kodinka Field to secure their place in line. By the next morning, the field was packed with an estimated half a million people, nearly half the population of Moscow, and far in excess of Grand Duke Sergei's predictions. In the crowd that day was famous Moscow reporter Vladimir Gilryovsky, a veteran of the 1877-1878 Russo-Turkey war and many other dangerous assignments. 
Though some 200 foreign correspondents had descended upon Moscow to report on the coronation celebrations, Goyarovsky was the only one covering the event at Kordinka, and his reporting would provide one of the few first-hand accounts of the tragedy that was about to unfold. At first, the reporter observed the festivities from a balcony at a horse-racing pavilion, but he soon descended to mingle with the crowd. It was then he realized that something was very, very wrong. People were packed so tightly that he claimed that he could barely swing an arm, and when the reporter realized he had left his tobacco tin back at the pavilion and attempted to wade back through the crowd, he found himself nearly crushed to death. But the worst was yet to come. At around 6am, rumors began circulating among the crowd that there wasn't enough beer or gift packages to go around, and that the commemorative enamel mugs also contained a gold coin. Fearful of missing out, people began storming up to the long rows of buffet tables and demanding that the artels, or official attendants, hand over the gifts. Intimidated by the angry crowds, the artels complied, and as news of this rippled through the crowd, the panic turned into a full-on stampede. Making matters worse, the terrified artels threw the gifts to the ground, causing people who stopped to pick them up to be knocked down and trampled to death by the surging crowd. The force of 1,800 police and mounted Cossacks tasked with crowd control proved completely ineffective, and the stampede carried on unabated. Gilyarovsky, who found himself caught in the deadly crush, later described the ordeal. Above a million crowd, steam began to rise, looking like a swamp mist. The crush was terrible. With many, she did badly. Some fainted without being able to get out or even fall, deprived of feelings, with eyes closed, compressed as in a vice. They swayed along with the mass. A tall, fine-looking old man who was standing next to me had not breathed for a long time. He choked in silence, died without a sound, and his cold corpse shook with us. Next to me, someone vomited. He could not even lower his head. It lasted not more than ten excruciating minutes. I was absolutely losing consciousness and getting exhausted of thirst. I fell down near the fence of a running route. I pulled out the grass and ate it. It quenched my thirst, and I went off. Gilyarovsky was fortunate to have been standing in an area where the Cossacks managed to temporarily break up the crowd, allowing him to make his escape. Others, however, were not so lucky. In another tragic oversight, the rows of buffet tables had been arranged perpendicularly to a large 64-meter-long ravine which had once been used for excavating clay and sand to make bricks. This arrangement served to funnel the stampeding crowd into the ravine where many fell and were trampled or crushed to death. The uneven, pockmarked grounds of the field, which had only been haphazardly covered in wooden boards and sand, also added to the death toll. When the crowd finally dispersed, and the dust settled. Hundreds of bodies lay scattered around Kodinka Field. Most were found in the ravine, piled several corpses high, but 27 lay at the bottom of a nearby well into which they had fallen and drowned. Many bodies were found surprisingly far from the field, shock and adrenaline having allowed the victims to flee the scene before succumbing to their injuries. In the end, the official death toll was recorded as 1,289, with the number of injuries estimated at anywhere between 1,200 and 20,000. News from Kodinka quickly reached Tsar Nicholas, who was deeply affected by the tragedy, later writing in his diary, Saturday, until now everything was going, thank God, like clockwork, but today there was a great mishap. The crowd staying overnight at Kodinka, awaiting the start of the distribution of lunch and mugs, pushed against buildings, and there was a terrible crush, and awful to say trampled around 1,300 people. I found out about it at ten and a half hours before the report of Minister of War Vanoski, a disgusting impression was left by this news. Nonetheless, on the orders of Grand Duke Sergei, all evidence of the tragedy was quickly cleared away, and at 2 p.m. that same day, the Tsar and Tsarina made an appearance in front of cheering crowds at Kodinka Field. Nicholas was scheduled to attend a ball that evening, hosted by the French ambassador, Gustave de Montebello, and initially considered cancelling all further festivities out of respect for the victims of Kodinka. In the end, however, he caved to pressure from his advisers and attended the ball anyway. This decision raised eyebrows among many attendees, including Chinese Imperial Commissioner Li Hong Zhang, who commented that no Chinese emperor would have attended the ball under the circumstances. It's now believed that Nicholas had no choice in the matter, as declining the invitation would have been perceived as a great slight and potentially jeopardized Russia's recent alliance with France. Indeed, according to Sergei Witt, Nicholas's finance minister, His Majesty left that ball soon. Evidently, the catastrophe gave him a strong impression. Nicholas and Alexandra spent most of the following day visiting the injured hospital and ordered that nearly 90,000 rubles in aid and leftover wine from state banquets be given to the families of the dead and injured. But the damage was already done. Nicholas's decision to attend the French ambassador's ball and to not cancel the rest of the coronation festivities left a sour taste in the mouth of many Russian people who came to see their new Tsar as tone deaf, out of touch, and uncaring. This sense of indignation was further exacerbated by the Imperial Crown's official policy of press censorship, with Vladimir Gyurovsky's article in the newspaper Ruski Vedomosti being the only official sanctioned account of Kodinka. Furthermore, the Crown's official 
response to the tragedy was to dismiss only a handful of minor officials, including Moscow Chief of Police Alexander Vlasovsky. As a result, Grand Duke Sergei became known to the public as the Prince of Kadinka, while the new Tsar received the moniker of Nicholas the Bloody. The general sense of gloom and foreboding in the wake of the tragedy is perhaps best captured in Vladimir Goyarovsky's memoirs, in which he recalled the words of an old typesetter at his newspaper's printing house. This means trouble. Nicholas's reign will be no good. Those words were to prove prophetic. A shy and retiring man, more at home with his stamp collection than affairs of state, Nicholas had never expected to become Tsar at such a young age. Only 26 when his father died in 1894, Nicholas had received little instruction on his formal imperial duties and proved ill-suited to task, his reign being plagued by a series of disasters. Nicholas presided over a series of anti-Semitic pogroms across Russia and in February 1904 declared war on Japan over disputed territories in Manchuria and Korea. The resulting Russo-Japanese war proved a disaster, resulting in over 50,000 Russian casualties and the annihilation of the Imperial fleet. On January the 22nd, 1905, a group of peaceful protesters led by Orthodox priest Father Georgi Gap unmarched on the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg with a petition calling for the end of the war, universal suffrage, and other reforms. Imperial guards and Cossacks opened fire on the crowd and killed 200 protesters, an event which became known as Bloody Sunday. This in turn touched off the 1905 Russian Revolution, which was brutally suppressed at the cost of a further 15,000 civilian lives. The beginning of the end, however, came in 1914, as Russia entered the Great War. As was tradition for the Tsars, Nicholas took direct command of the Russian armed forces, with predictably disastrous consequences. The Russian army, poorly trained and desperately short of weapons, ammunition, and even boots, suffered heavy casualties and a string of humiliating defeats, and in 1917 collapsed altogether. This, along with severe food shortages at home, set the stage for the February Revolution, which resulted in Nicholas's abdication and the end of the Russian monarchy. Following the Bolsheviks' rise to power in the October Revolution, Nicholas and his family were transported to Yekaterinburg in the Ural Mountains and executed on July the 17th, 1918, bringing the Romanov dynasty to an end. While no single factor or event was uniquely responsible for the collapse of the Russian monarchy, the tragedy of Kadinka on May the 30th, 1896, was instrumental in turning public opinion against Nicholas II and fermenting revolutionary ideas among the Russian people. Thus, in one of those strange twists of history, the fall of the Romanov dynasty was caused, at least in part, by a shortage of beer and sausage. So, keep that in mind for your next dinner party. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.